morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yesterday, we concluded with a discussion of uh, nine particular major prophecies in the Bible describing who were God's chosen people, what is their land, and what is their destiny. And before we continue, I'll review some of those those uh, prophecies. We'll finish enumerating those prophecies and continue to the next portion of the book. The author of this book, by the way, which is entitled A Woman Rides the Beast, Dave Hunt, describes these nine major prophecies. Number one, God promised a land of clearly defined boundaries for his people. Number two, it is a historical fact that God brought these chosen people, see Exodus chapter 7, Deuteronomy 7, and chapter 14, into their promised land. Number three, when the Jewish people entered the promised land, God warned them that if they practiced the idolatry and immorality of the land's previous inhabitants, the Canaanites, whom he had destroyed for their evil, he would cast them out as well. This has happened, again, it's an an undisputable fact of history. Now, number four, God declared that his people would be scattered among all people from one end of the earth to the other, as found in Deuteronomy and 1 Kings, Nehemiah, Amos, Zechariah. And then number five is God warned that whenever they, uh, wherever they wandered, the Jews would be, quote, an astonishment, a proverb, a byword, a curse, and a reproach. The Deuteronomy chapter 28, Chronicles 7, uh, Jeremiah 29 and, and 44. And amazingly, all of these things have come true throughout history. Bible prophecy fulfilled. This is how we know that we serve the God of creation by the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Number six, that they would be persecuted and killed as no other peoples on the face of the earth. Number seven, he would not let his chosen people be destroyed, but would preserve them as an identifiable ethnic and national group. Number uh, number eight, he would bring them back into their la- their own land in the last days. And number nine, God declared that in the last days, before the Messiah's second coming, Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone for all people. That is recorded in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. All these things have been fulfilled in history. Now the question is, who are God's people? Were they the Jews that rejected him, that still reject him today? Or is this speaking of the, those who remain in the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is this talking about an earthly kingdom, as the world is convinced today? Or is it talking about a heavenly kingdom? Is it talking about Jerusalem, Israel, the modern nation state of Israel, the capital of which is Jerusalem? Or... Is it the capital of Jerusalem? Is it Tel Aviv? Is it confusing? Well, it's intended to be confusing for those that don't understand, but those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it's not confusing at all. The whole world is burdened about a physical Israel, a physical Jerusalem, and a physical kingdom, all of which the Pope intends to rule. the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. God destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., destroyed the temple, destroyed the sacrificial system. But are all these prophecies of of, uh, no use now? No, they apply to another kingdom called Israel and another Jerusalem, a heavenly 
the new Jerusalem which comes down out of, from God out of heaven. And its citizens will be those of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those who believe Jesus Christ. Now, to dispel all the myths and all the false teachings of Christianity today that have the world's eyes focused upon the modern nation state of Israel and Jerusalem. Those false beliefs that make Jerusalem a cup of trembling for the whole world. And you'll see for yourself what God actually intended for his people. A new Jerusalem, a heavenly kingdom, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And there'll be no pope in that kingdom. There'll be no antichrist in that kingdom. They will only be Jesus Christ and his followers, his believers. It'll be a pristine utopia under a righteous, benevolent ruler. And I can't wait for that kingdom. It appears to me that Dave Hunt was just as deceived about these prophecies as is everyone else today. And I don't wish to take a personal issue with Dave Hunt, by the way, who was recently deceased. I just want to dispel the myths. Now, we'll continue where we left off yesterday on page 24, if you're following along in your own copy of the book. Dave Hunt says, even more remarkable, and he reads the ninth prophecy, the ninth major prophecy in the Bible regarding Israel. He says, God declared that in the last days before the Messiah's second coming, Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone for all people. See Zechariah chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. And he says at the time of Zechariah, at the time Zechariah uttered this prophecy 2,500 years ago, Jerusalem lay in ruins and was surrounded by wilderness. And so it remains century after century. Zechariah's prophecy seemed to be utter madness, even after Israel's rebirth in 1948. Yet today, exactly as foretold, a world of nearly six billion people has its eyes upon Jerusalem, fearful that the next war, if it breaks out, will be fought over that tiny city. What an incredible fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And it is indeed. But we are not to be deceived by the colossal lie that is being told by the Vatican and by the Christian churches today. You see, Rome has a special design for the physical modern nation state of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem today to perpetrate upon the world the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Rome intends to lead this new world order, a, a global kingdom of Christ, the cosmic Christ. It's an earthly kingdom, a diabolical kingdom, a tyrannical kingdom that will resemble everything that we know about the old world order. That is not the kingdom of Christ. He's deceiving the Jews. He's deceiving the Christians. The whole world is deceived about what purpose the modern nation state of Israel and particularly Jerusalem and the Jews play in that land. And uh, again, Israel occupies about one-sixth of one percent of the land area which the Arabs possess. The Arabs have the oil, the wealth, and the worldwide influence which, uh, with, uh, which such seemingly inexhaustible resources command. Not only is Israel's postage stamp piece of land scarcely discernible on a world map, but it lacks all the essentials to make it the center of worldwide concern. In defiance of all reason, however, it is the focus of world attention precisely as prophesied. Jerusalem is a small city of neither commercial importance nor strategic location. Yet the eyes of the world are upon it as upon no other city. Jerusalem is indeed a burdensome stone around the necks of all the nations of the world, the most vexing and volatile problem of the United Nations today. 
There's no other explanation for this. What the Hebrew prophets declared thousands of years ago, and what seemed utterly fantastic in their time, is being fulfilled in our day. This is only part of the evidence, as we shall see, that the prophesied last days are upon us, and that our generation will likely see the remainder of Bible prophecy fulfilled. The prophecies outlined above, to say nothing of scores of others, have been a matter of public record on the pages of Scripture and available for careful examination for centuries. That they have been fulfilled in specific detail cannot be the result of mere chance but is in fact more than sufficient proof for the existence of God who inspired the Bible and of that book's authenticity and inerrancy. That is our greatest claim to the authenticity of the Bible is the minutely detailed fulfillment of Bible prophecy. No other book on the planet can compare with it. God has... has made himself distinct in the world by this one characteristic of the Scripture. And as as I've said on Inquisition Update before, I'll say again, it bears repeating, that Bible prophecy is not giving, given to us so much that we can predict accurately the future, but that once these prophecies are fulfilled, then we see their fulfillment in history and we are once again reminded of just how masterfully God has proven himself to be the author of this book and the creator of all heaven and earth, the true God of creation. And uh, when people accuse me on amateur radio and other discussions that I have of having a blind faith, I have an immediate and convincing er- uh, answer to their, to their doubt. And all one has to do is show them the Bible prophecies and how they were fulfilled precisely as given. And the one I am most enamored with today is an understanding of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And that prophecy still has assured me that this book is inspired from cover to cover, It is without error, it is the word of God Almighty, and it is to be believed, and it is to be understood. And if we believe and understand, as it is written, Daniel's 70-week prophecy, we understand that it is perfectly and completely fulfilled. All 70 weeks of that prophecy was fulfilled by the Messiah 2,000 years ago. And once you understand that, then, once you understand that, then you can understand why Jerusalem is such a cup of trembling in the world today. While, while all the, why all the nations of the world are troubled by this new modern nation state of Israel. And I can only hope and pray that through the Spirit of God, that people will come to the understanding that the papacy, together with the kings of the earth, are manually trying to refulfill the 70th week of Daniel. And because of that struggle to fulfill that prophecy in a convincing way, they've had to deceive the whole world and use the whole world and manipulate the whole world. And I'm telling you, and I can say this with certainty, the nation-state of Israel today is not for the purpose of saving the Jews, not to give the Jews a homeland. It is it is Rome's answer, final answer for the Jewish question. It is her final attempt to fulfill what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, replacement theology. They're going to replace the God of the Bible with the God of this world in the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And all the Protestant churches, the once called Protestant churches, now called evangelical churches, I call them ecumenical, evangelibelly churches, are just as convinced as the rest of the deceived world that Jerusalem is the focus of all these Bible prophecies. And it's simply not the case. Jesus is going to return. He's going to establish his kingdom. But it's not going to be in Jerusalem, Israel. 
not the modern nation state of Israel as we know it today. That little postage stamp sized piece of land that the Vatican desires for itself, through which it might deceive the whole world through a phony refulfillment of, of, of the 70th week of Daniel. I hope my listeners are beginning to comprehend this. I want to hear from my listeners. If you're beginning to understand what we're, we're talking about here on Inquisition Update, I'd sure love to know it. I'd love to know that this message is not falling on deaf ears. Futurism is a hard thing to shake, and I can tell you from personal experience. Having believed in dispensational futurism for the first 50 years of my life, I can tell you, even now, after knowing the truth, it's easy to slip back into that old way of thinking. I have to correct myself every now and then when that belief, that thing that I've been indoctrinated with since I was old enough to go to church, keeps coming up, keeps confusing me. It's a difficult thing to shake, but it is an error, a gross error, and it's going to cause the Christians of today to not know the time of their visitation. Just as confusion of this same Bible prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, caused the Jews not to know the time of their visitation 2,000 years ago. Now, Dave Hunt says, the prophecies outlined above to say nothing of scores of others have been a matter of public record on the pages of Scripture and available for careful examination for centuries. That they have been fulfilled in specific detail cannot be the result of mere chance, but is in fact more than sufficient proof for the existence of God, the God who inspired the Bible, and of that book's authenticity and inerrancy. In view of such clear and overwhelming evidence, one can only charitably assume that no agnostic or atheist has bothered to read the, the biblical prophecies and check them personally against history and current events. There are additional prophecies concerning Israel and Jerusalem which pertain to the last days and still await future fulfillment. We may be certain on the basis of the property, prophecies which have already come true that these two will surely be realized and in the not-too-distant future. The most appalling time of utter destruction, both for the Jews and for the entire population of the world, lies yet ahead. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. I want to ask my listeners again, when you read Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, and it talks about Jacob's trouble, I want you to ask yourself, who is Jacob today? Are they disbelieving Jews in Israel? Or are they God's true people? Those of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, with astonishing accuracy, the Bible does not single out Damascus, Cairo, London, or Paris as the center of action in the last days. But two other specific sites, Jerusalem and Rome, they are diverse have been enemies since the days of Caesars and remarkably are still rivals today for spiritual supremacy. Let me tell you, Rome dominates both. Rome dominates both. Rome and Jerusalem today. Catholic Rome, according to Dave Hunt, claims to be the eternal city and the holy city Titles which the Bible has given to Jerusalem. I will ask the listeners again. Which Jerusalem? The one on this earth? Or the one that comes down from God out of heaven? Rome also claims to be the new Jerusalem, putting her in direct conflict with God's promises concerning the true city of David. Again, we must ask ourselves... Is Rome the new Jerusalem? Is the Jerusalem in Israel the new Jerusalem? Where From where does the new Jerusalem come? The scriptures are plain about it. So why are we trembling over an earthly Jerusalem? 
why all of this concern about Jerusalem in the modern nation state of Israel today? Why has Rome and the churches who are now united with her deceiving the whole world about Jerusalem and about God's people? Rome is indeed in direct conflict with God's promises concerning the true city of David. There have been 2,000 years of tension and antagonism between Rome and Jerusalem. For nearly 46 years after Israel's rebirth in 1948, the Vatican refused to acknowledge her right to exist. Imagine that. It was the Vatican, it was Rome, who brought about the new modern nation state of Israel. But she doesn't want the world to know it and to distance herself from having anything to do with it, to make it look like it was God's providence and not Rome's manipulation, she simply refused to acknowledge Israel's existence in the world. And by that, has deceived the whole world. Interesting discussion? Stay tuned, there'll be more right after the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com Worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you would like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And we thank Brother Nicholas for seeing the value of this information and putting it on the air for the listeners. Please support First Amendment Radio. Now, Dave Hunt concludes this chapter by saying, there have been 2,000 years of tension and antagonism between Rome and Jerusalem. 
That is absolutely correct. And why has Rome been so concerned over Jerusalem for the last 2,000 years? Because she knows that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Rome does not like that fulfillment and would like to fulfill it according to her, her desire. And that is to make the papacy the Messiah of Israel, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And she's done everything in her power to deceive the whole world to anticipate that eventuality, to make Israel, or to make rather Jerusalem the capital for the Pope and to declare himself the Messiah. And for 2,000 years, the papacy has striven by war, crusades, and intrigue and every other means to get control of Jerusalem for that very purpose. And Rome is more determined in her efforts to control that city and that portion of the world than she has ever been in her entire history. For 2,000 years, only now, has Rome gained the power and access and strength and has deceived the world enough to believe in her phony refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, to deceive the Jews, to receive the wrongs, Messiah. You see, they're still waiting for their the first coming of Christ, having rejected Jesus. And the papacy cleverly has also deceived those who claim to follow Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and to focus all of their attention also on Jerusalem, so that they may be deceived and to receive the papacy as Christ's vicar on the earth. Satan has been attempting to deceive the whole world for 2,000 years through Rome. And I, I'm just here to tell you, the churches today are all prepared because of their belief in dispensational futurism, because of their failure to understand Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, Rome has them prepared to accept a lie, to believe a lie. And I consider myself blessed of God not to be deceived any longer about this and privileged to be able to expose this deception to my listeners and hopeful that God will inspire you to become more and more familiar with this deception and to help expose the greatest lie, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. He says there have been 2,000 years of tension and antagonism between Rome and Jerusalem. For nearly 46 years after Israel's rebirth in 1948, the Vatican refused to acknowledge her right to exist. Rome refused to acknowledge the existence of the very state she created. That's to cover her involvement in its creation. Do not be deceived. Rome is all behind the creation of the modern nation state of Israel to confuse the whole world as to who are the Jews, what is Israel, and what is Jerusalem. To convert everyone's hopes and beliefs in, a, in an earthly kingdom and to deceive them away from the heavenly one Christ is preparing to bring down from heaven. He says that animosity has not been erased by the recent overtures which the Vatican has found it expedient to make toward Israel. Rome wants to influence the future of Jerusalem. No, she wants to control the future of Jerusalem, which she still insists must be an international city over which Israel will have no more say than any other nation. Okay? Dave Hunt understands that the Vatican wants to have complete control in Jerusalem. I wish Dave Hunt were still alive today so that I could have these discussions with him, but he's gone, and it's because his mind was polluted as was mine with dispensational futurism. He says, with awesome precision, the Bible identifies Jerusalem and Rome as the focal points of prophesied last day's events. Both will come in for their share of God's judgment. 
It requires little more than casual attention to the daily news to recognize the accuracy of that forecast. Here, too, in what the Bible says about Rome and the Vatican City, we have additional evidence that this book is God's Word, evidence that we will be examining in detail. Now, we're going to move to chapter 3 of this book, and he begins this chapter with some quotes from the Scripture. Quote, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. That was taken from a sermon by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, and yet another one from Acts chapter 17, verse 2 and 3, Paul speaking this time in a, sim- in a similar ser- uh, sermon, quote, Paul, for three Sabbath days, reasoned with them, that is, the Jews in the synagogue, out of the Old Testament scriptures, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ the Messiah. Okay? Do you suppose Paul was confused about Daniel's prophecy? The 70th week of Daniel? I don't believe Paul was deceived at all. That deception was left for our generation. Now, chapter 3 begins, it's entitled, A Passover Plot? Question mark. Listen to the extent to which Satan would de- try to deceive the whole world. The prophecies concerning the second major theme of the Bible, the coming of the Messiah, are even more numerous and detailed than those pertaining to Israel. These prophecies have also been dealt with at some length in my previous books, so we will only summarize a few of them briefly here. Even the most anti-Christian critics who deny categorically that Jesus of Nazareth is the Savior of the world admit that many specific messianic prophecies were fulfilled in his life and crucifixion. In the attempt to explain away the significance of that fact, some bizarre theories have been invented. Typical of such attempts was a book and a movie, neither of which were very successful some years back, entitled The Passover Plot. Its thesis was that Jesus, knowing some of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, conspired with Judas Iscariot to fulfill them in order to make it appear that he was the promised Messiah. Okay, How absurd and how anti-Christian. Now, this is hardly worth discussing, but it just goes to show what effort the Christ-haters will go to repudiate Jesus Christ. Now, he says, obviously, it would have been ludicrous for Jesus to get himself crucified in order to convince a small band of uneducated inept followers that he was the Christ. In fact, neither his disciples nor any other Jew, including even John the Baptist, could believe, though the prophecies were clear, as Christ explained often, that the Messiah was to be crucified. His death rather seemed proof that he was not the Messiah, though fulfilling the prophecies concerning his crucifixion to the letter, as he did, would not have been the way to gather a following. In fact, Christ's death in fulfillment of Scripture was in order to pay for the penalties of the sins of the world. The prophecies concerning his death, see Psalms chapter 22, verse 16, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and verses 8 through 10 and 12, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, etc., were avoided by the Jews as impenetrable mysteries because they seem totally at odds with other prophecies, declaring plainly that the Messiah would ascend David's throne and rule over a magnificent kingdom. How could the Messiah establish a kingdom and a peace that would never end, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, and yet be rejected and crucified by his own people? It seemed impossible for both to be it seemed impossible for both to be true, so the Jewish interpreters simply ignored what didn't seem to make sense to them. 
I want to ask my listeners a question. How much are we ignoring in the Scriptures today because we just simply can't make sense of them? You ever catch yourself reading over the Scriptures and finding something that you just don't understand and you just skip past it? There's a wealth of information in those passages. And I suggest to my listeners that many of those passages can be clearly understood once we dis- once we discern who it is in the world that occupies the office of Antichrist, and that is the papacy. Once we understand the correct interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, once we see that it was Jesus who fulfilled all 70 weeks of that prophecy 2,000 years ago, then there is much in the Bible that we just overlook because we don't understand and we don't understand simply because we've been lied to. And all of a sudden those scriptures come out with un- incredible meaning that we never perceived before. When I had these discussions with my sister a couple years ago, she wept. She said, Tom, I've got to read the Bible all over again. And I said, certainly you do, sis, but before you do, make sure you take off the church's glasses and just read it as it is written. Never mind what the church says about the Bible. Just read it as it is written and read it with the understanding of who the Antichrist is and how he is deceiving the whole world. And I've yet to hear from her, and I hope someday that I'll know the truth. That, sh- that, that she'll know the truth. Now, it says that the Jews were able to crucify Jesus was the final triumphant proof to the rabbis. And it served as the disappointing but undeniable evidence to the Jewish masses and his most devoted disciples that Jesus of Nazareth couldn't possibly have been the Messiah. The prophesied messianic kingdom had not been established nor had he brought peace to Israel by delivering her from her enemies. Though at best, he could only have been a well-meaning imposter, and at worst, a deliberate fraud. Such remains the argument of most Jews today. But look what's happening in Israel and Jerusalem today. Okay? The prophesied messianic kingdom had not been established by Jesus Christ. Who do you suppose wishes to establish that messianic kingdom today in Jerusalem. It's the Pope, the Antichrist. Okay? Jesus had not brought peace to Israel by delivering Israel from her enemies. Who in the world today wants to bring peace to Israel and to deliver her from her enemies? The Pope of Rome. I just received from one of my listeners an email, a clip from a newspaper in Jerusalem telling how the wife of Bibi Netanyahu is just thrilled to not express her glee that the new pope, the new Jesuit pope, Jorge, or rather Antichrist, Jorge Bergoglio, is going to be in Jerusalem in May. Going to come to visit Jerusalem in May. And Bibi Netanyahu's wife is just incapable of expressing her hope for that visit. I wonder what that could be. He says, so at best, he could only have been, that is, Jesus could only have been a well-meaning imposter. Who wants to make Jesus the well-meaning imposter today? In Jerusalem. In Israel. The Pope of Rome. Right? And at worst... A deliberate fraud. That's what Rome wants to project upon Jesus, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, in the hopes that the world will accept a counterfeit who calls himself the vicar of Christ. The Jews have rejected Jesus. They still reject Jesus, and they're looking for a Messiah. Rome has manipulated affairs in the Middle East until the Jews fear every minute of every day for their lives. 
and Rome has situated herself to be their Messiah. The papacy has situated itself to become the Messiah of the Jews, to set up a kingdom to, to bring peace to Israel and to the Jews. And the whole world is focused on all of that shenanigans. The whole Christian world has every hope for the Jews and Israel and Jerusalem. And I'm here to tell you what the Vatican has in store for the Jews and Israel and Jerusalem is directly counter to what the Bible teaches. It deals with an entirely different set of people, an entirely different city, and an entirely different country, and an entirely different king. He says there was, however, one way to reconcile the apparent contradiction. The Messiah had to come twice, the first time to die for man's sins, the second time to reign on the Davidic throne. Where do you suppose the Davidic throne is going to come from? Is it going to come from Jerusalem and Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean? Or is it going to come down from God out of heaven? He says, but even when Jesus explained that fact ahead of time, no one could understand it. It would it would take his resurrection to open blind eyes. Let me tell you, that resurrection is when God's people should recognize that the transference of the kingdom of Christ became not of this world, but of a heavenly world. The resurrection was the bridge between the earthly Israel and the heavenly Israel. We, God's people, Israel, are to cross that bridge and no longer be concerned with this phony counterfeit taking place on the world stage in and on every television program, every radio program, every newspaper, every church in this country, we are not to be deceived. We are not to be a part of an earthly kingdom, but a kingdom of Christ, a heavenly kingdom, one which comes down from God out of heaven. We need to know who we are, and we need to know who the liars are. Now, beyond a mere man, he says... Yet there were a few prophecies which Jesus of Nazareth could have conspired with Judas or others to fulfill. Most prophecies, however, were beyond the control of any mere man. Why? Because Jesus was not any mere man. He was God. For example, being born in Jerusalem and the seed of David were major requirements of, for the Messiah, as given in prophecy. The timing of the Messiah's birth, too, as foretold, was obviously beyond the influence of any ordinary mortal. His birth had to occur before the scepter departed from Judah. See Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. While the temple was standing, according to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, while the genealogical records were available to prove his, gen his lineage, According to Second Samuel chapter seven and verse twelve, and Psalms chapter eight, uh, Psalms eighty nine, etc., and shortly before the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed, see Daniel chapter nine verse twenty six. There was a narrow window of time during which the Messiah had to come, and he did. I will say it was more than just a narrow window of time; it was a specific day. Okay? Now let me be clear. In Daniel's prophecy, it lists two separate periods of time. Consecutive, well listen, to be accurate, three separate periods of time. A seven week period, a 62 week period, which together makes 69 weeks, and it says after the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off. He was cut off after the 69th week. That leaves no other interpretation but that he was crucified during the 70th week. And I can tell you exactly. It was three and a half years after the 69th week. Three and one half years into the 70th week of Daniel was Messiah cut off. 
So why all this talk about the 70th week of Daniel being separated by 2,000 years of time? The, the, the teaching in Daniel's prophecy is too easy to miss. And yet the churches, no rather the Vatican, together with the Jesuits, have confused the whole world as to the fulfillment of that 70th week prophecy. Why? Because they want to put up their own Messiah. One that the Jews can accept. One that the whole world has already accepted. Remember, it was Pope John Paul II who got together with all the religious leaders of the world in Assisi in the late 80s. And they all declared him the religious leader of the world. Remember Vatican Council II that ended in 1965, where it was told the, the Protestants, you got to come home to mama. You've been believing in futurism for the last three generations. You all agree that the, that the Antichrist doesn't come till the last seven years of time. So the Antichrist cannot be, as the Protestant reformers all unanimously declared and preached from the rooftops, that it was the Pope, the papacy, that was the Antichrist. You've proven up three generations of Protestants, you are no longer Protestant. You've abandoned the Protestant Reformation because you believed in a future Antichrist, and you deny by that admission, you deny any longer believing that the, the papacy is the Antichrist. So you must accept, by your own actions, by your own demonstrations, by your own beliefs, that the Protestant Reformation was a lie. And worse than that, it was an assault against the legitimate throne of God on earth, the papacy. And you must join the Roman Catholic Church. You've got to come home to Mama. You have surrendered your Protestant Reformation. You have repudiated the Protestant Reformers and the Protestant Reformation. You believe now in a future Antichrist because we deceived you with our def- with our interpretation of Daniel 9.27. You bought it. You've, con- you've, you've signed your name to it for three generations. Now you've got to come home to Rome. And that's what they're doing through the ecumenical movement. So now that they believe, they all believe in a future Antichrist, and the Jews are hoping for their first Messiah, Rome's sitting here ready to produce a seven-year peace treaty, and you know that every Bible-believing, or rather every ecumenical evangelical belly in this country who has been sold the futurist lie is ready to identify whoever puts up a seven-year peace treaty for the Jews they are going to label him Antichrist, and there isn't anybody ever going to change their mind. And if he is the Antichrist, who signs a treaty with the Jews and then breaks that treaty with the Jews, then the whole world, the Jews included, are, be, are going to be ready for their Messiah. And it's not going to be Jesus. It's going to be an earthly king. And his current seat is in Rome. And I hope my listeners are beginning to come to this realization. Sorry to have run out of time at a most poignant part of the discussion. We'll continue tomorrow on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.